Okay, cool. Right, guys. So um, thank you very much for having me. I, yeah, I've been doing this for a while and this is a bit of a trip, like a journey through my experience and dealing with this problem. It's a global problem. And um, I'm a, I think I, I, I try to say, well, I, I like to say I'm a, a half full glass type of guy. So rather than always seeing the doom and gloom, I'm trying to figure out what I can do about it and what's the, what's, how can, how can we fix things? Um, I, I was looking through this presentation, I've given several versions of this in my life, and um, I always have had this slide in here. And it's quite interesting to give these sorts of talks before and after the pandemic, because before the pandemic, we went through a very long period where, yes, there was, there were pandemics going on across the globe. They were mostly going on in Asia. And, um, but we here in the Western world, we were quite far removed from it, except, um, well, in ca cases of domestic animals here in the UK, we did have um, stuff happening. And then I'm, I'm, I have corals in here because I am married to a coral biologist. And the reason why Alex mentioned corals before is because when you have, um, you know, common interests and goals, you meet people in life, sometimes you marry them. And I know way more about corals than I probably should. I've mostly been focused on amphibians. But um, the common thread here is that basically uh, animal health or just health of ecosystems is like a really important part of the work that I do. And it's become really important for us humans as well, obviously. And um, I'll, Alex, I think mentioned this before, I am incredibly lucky. Um, this is a picture of myself, my brother. This is probably in our early 1980s. So a long, long time ago. And I grew up in Costa Rica and Costa Rica back then was paradise. People didn't know where it was. Um, you, it was a very quiet place, but it was so full of stuff. And I remember just growing up with all sorts of creatures in the garden. And one of the things I grew up with is um, these wonderful toads. We had these things in the garden. There was a stream, well, near our garden. And um, these, these frogs here are actually toads. They're called harlequin toads. They're part of a group of South American toads that make it all the way to Costa Rica. And their northernmost distribution is the place where Alex and I do our research or a lot of our research in Guanacaste in Costa Rica. And these guys used to occur there. And they used to be so common um, around Easter time when the first rains came around that um, if you would be walking on a stream, you couldn't basically put your, your feet down on the ground without stepping on one of these things. They would come out and breed in mass and then disappear again. And what's happened over time is that um, a lot of these things have disappeared and we've not seen them again. And the key thing about it, and um, yes, there's lots of obvious things that we've done to, to natural ecosystems that um, have caused a lot of these declines. But the, the, the really scary thing at the time was that these things were disappearing in these perfectly beautiful untouched mountains that apparently um, they seem pristine and, and protected. So, you know, basically people at the time were saying, well, classic conservation is dead. What's the point of actually looking after um, creating national parks if, if the things that are in it are gonna die anyway? So, you know, there's obviously, there's a lot of debate about these things. Um, I, I'll say it right away. It's incredibly important to protect these um, ecosystems because things do come back as I'll tell you in a bit as well. So it's not all doom and gloom. And today, the story that I'll tell you about is very much focused on this um, um, skin fungus, Batrachotrichum dendrobatidis. It's a mouthful, so I'll call it BD from here on. But I also want to highlight that there's a whole series of other emerging diseases out there uh, causing problems. Um, there's, a, for example, one that I'm working on at the moment is called, it's a part of the Ranovars family, it's sort of like a frog Ebola, and there's other things. Um, so, you know, the, the biggest focus has been on this pathogen, but there's other things out there. And um, I um, recently went back to Costa Rica and my best friend's um, dad used to take us out and catch these animals. It's a long story, but it's one of the reasons why I became a biologist. And he used to take pictures of uh, the things we caught. And um, these are some of these ripped out of his photo album, some of these Atelopus varios, the variable harlequin toad. And um, this is really interesting. These guys disappeared. And I, I mean, interesting in the sense that Rio Claro is one locality, it's one river, and basically you would get all these different color morphs around this single one river. And you would have the lowland morphs, which are mostly like these guys and these guys, and as you went up, they went whiter, and they looked a bit different. So like, you know, 
we have lost a tremendous amount of diversity. And actually today I saw a paper published in biological conservation that measures the biodiversity, that di genetic diversity loss. So yeah, these are some pictures of things that no longer occur. Um, at the Lopus, um, this one here is, oh God, I forget its name now. Uh, Senex, there we go. Uh, used to be endemic for two mountains. So these are the mountains that were right um, below the house I grew up in. These guys have disappeared and we've not seen, not seen those since. These guys here, for example, they have made it back in some places in very small relictual populations. So um, we, we, the, the tricky part of with amphibians and there's quite a large group of organisms where we have this problem, it's like they do fluctuate naturally. And they, they with amphibians, they, they tend to have this very short period of time where they come out and we mostly study them uh, when they are reproducing. Uh, my, my old herpetology lecturer at the University of Costa Rica used to say it was a bit like if um, extraterrestrials would come to earth and derive all the knowledge of humans based on watching us having sex. Basically amphibians are a bit like that. We know uh, quite a lot about them while they're mating, but then they disappear and we don't know very much about them. Um, and the best data sets really we have is from the Northern hemispheres or from Europe and the United States. And we now know that when we look at those data sets, that these very um, precipitous declines we had in the 1980s, we started to already see some declines in the 1970s. And outside, you know, the, the, the disease world has been, there's all sorts of other factors. Um, for a long time, UV radiation was blamed for some of these declines at higher elevations, but one of the things as humans we've managed to fix or sort out a bit better or things have improved is with the ozone hole. So like that's no longer that big of an issue, but we definitely have loads of pesticides, habitat fragmentation, you name it. All these things have an effect and I don't want to detract from these factors. Um, but the story today is mostly about this emerging fungal pathogen, BD, or uh, an amphibian chytrid. What do we know about MBD is um, that it's mostly aquatic. It has these motile zoospores that look like sperm and that's the infective stage. And they can basically like they can swim in some cases to the substrate they need and find it and append it themselves to it. It infects keratin and in, in amphibians, that's basically the adult skin and tadpoles, that is just the mouth part. So what happens with tadpoles is that they get infected, they lose their mouth parts and then um, they, can either uh, lose infection when they lose all their mouth parts. And if they survive that, they can actually regrow the mouth parts and come back. But there are cascading effects through development with having had infection. So um, for example, if you, if you had an infection and you were not able to feed throughout your um, life cycle through your metamorphosis enough, you'll metamorphose at a smaller size. And obviously that has long-term consequences. But basically what happens is usually they, Tadpoles go through metamorphosis, and once they go through metamorphosis, they, um, they infection spreads through their entire skin, and then they disrupt vital skin function, so the breathing. Uh, I got to remind you that, obviously, hopefully you know that amphibian skin is really important, and, you know, for example, with neotropical salamanders, the plethodont family down in Central America, um, they, some, some of them don't even have lungs, so they do the entire osmoregulation slash breathing through their skin. So you mess with the skin and you kill them. Like most organisms, BD has a range of temperatures in which it grows best, it, it functions best. So the optimal temperature is between 17 and 25 degrees Celsius. It dies above 30 degrees Celsius and it dies with desiccation. So basically um, the ideal environments for these organisms, for this disease to develop in is in those mountains in the tr in tropical areas is in, in mountains where it's cooler and more moist cloud forests and, and pre-montane forests. Um, so early on, there was like, obviously like with, with, with a coronavirus, but back then we were not monitoring frogs like we were monitoring with coronavirus, plus we didn't have the tools back in the 1980s, 1990s, like we do now. Um, molecular tools for diagnostics are, are actually fairly recent. Um, Back then there was this hypothesis of spread and it basically started with like, this is Monteverde in Costa Rica, which is a really, hopefully you can see my mouse. And if not, um, Alex, please uh, let me know. But basically this is the, thank you. 
This is Monteverde, and this is, we know really well when things uh, declined are the golden toad and harlequin toads and a bunch of other, uh, mostly stream breeding amphibians disappeared. And then in 1993, down here, Karen Lips was doing her um, PhD on frog ecology. And um, as, a, as you know, as most of us parachute scientists, she would go in for field season and go out. And one of the times she went back, the frogs were gone. And then she moved back to Panama to Fortuna in 1996. She witnessed frogs disappearing then, there and then 2002 in Santa Fe. And then 2006, the famous El Copé, um, basically, which ended up actually proving the, the cause and effect of disease emergence and um, mass decline of amphibians. But, um, you know, there's this proposed wave of, of spread. But one of the things that I started doing early on before the, we had these really cool new, well, you know, PCR tools that we can use now for diagnostics, good old histology where you get a bit of skin of a museum specimen, so like this. Um, and just to like show you a picture of it, this is like, these are chytrid uh, sporangia and the little dots inside are zoospores. And this is a zoospore that has this tube basically opened up to release the zoospores and reinfect the whole, uh, the, the same animal or spread it across different animals. So you can slice up skin from frogs and you can look at where you found it. And we found actually um, that there was chytrid found in, in specimens collected before the wave and also after the wave. So um, it got us thinking about, well, you know, what's the, what's happening here? Can, can, could there be a lag time between the time chytrid arrives in a system and it um, causes that mass outbreak and this, you know, lots of papers have been written about and there's been a big, big discussion about it, but the evidence is that yes, there, there is in some cases a lag and um, it could be simply that there's a period of time in which this is building up in the system or it's, or not mutually exclusive, it's waiting for, um, for the right environmental conditions for it to cause an outbreak. Now this slide here is a work by Alan Pounce in Monteverde. It's, it's a friend and collaborator who's done a, the bulk of um, climate change work in tropical cloud forests. And it's just to put this all into context and, and also to point out that we know we all live in our little micro worlds. So I've done most of my work on amphibians, um, but I'm lucky enough to work with people like Alex and um, people like Alan and people like Dan Jansen who do all sorts of other things. and. The context is really clear. Um, these amphibian declines did not occur in a vacuum. It was not just frogs disappearing and everything was fine. There was this whole, and I've stolen this out of Alan's paper in this Nature 1999 paper. It's a whole constellation of changes happening. So Alan actually, when he arrived in Monteverde, he was working on anoles on these like lizards that live in, in the cloud forest as well. And Alan at the time, he was, um, doing his PhD slash, slash postdoc, and he was go coming and going, and he was measuring the abundance of, and of these um, cloud forest anoles and montane anoles. No data means that he went home to Florida, where he was from for a while, and, and worked there for a while. And then he came back to Costa Rica, and then he came back just to document the decline of these anoles. And pretty much something that really doesn't get spoken about much is that these high cloud forest anoles and montane anoles, and there's another couple of species, declined roughly around the same time as, um, or a little bit after than these frogs, and they have not really recovered. So it's not just frogs, it's also anoles that have disappeared. Um, and this is some of the data that they had at the time. So this is data from Fleischmann's glass frog. So there was an, yet another person doing a PhD, and they noticed that um, at the that there was a first decline of glass frogs in this period here of 1983, 1984. And when you talk with Alan and with other people at the time, this period of the late 1980s is like a, 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 a turning point in the climate change story where a lot of things actually start changing very, very fast. So uh, the weather patterns change. Um, so less, than, less horizontal rainfall, so less clouds and mist in the, in the forest, but also you start getting an invasion from lowland birds up in the highlands. These glass, frog, these glass frogs declined and this was correlated very strongly with a very strong El Nino. And this issue of El Nino will coming up again. Hopefully you guys will know what El Nino is. And if not, Alex will signal me or will tell me if I need to do something more about this. But um, in a nutshell, El Nino is this um, cycle that um, basically 
is produced by climatic cycle by hot water that is um, forms in the let me get this right the western pacific so around australia and indonesia and it spreads across to the eastern pacific and that changes the weather patterns across the globe and in this area of the world it dries out the pacific side so in costa rica the pacific side goes to this extreme dry period of the slurry system that Alex and I work in gets really, really dry. Right now we are in La Nina cycle, so it is really, really wet. And what's happened over time is that these natural cycles with climate change have become more intense and more uh, the frequency has increased. So this first crash here of glass frogs allowed them to recover and some species recover and crash and come back. And some species um, just disappear like the golden toad. So the golden toad, the two years before the decline of the golden toad, they basically um, they didn't reproduce, and then they disappeared and they were never seen again. So hopefully that puts everything into context. And then we were trying to find a link with um, climate change and amphibian declines, and a lot of the times these hypotheses um, they've been pitted against each other. So it's this false dichotomy that it's either climate or it's either or disease, and I've never really understood why these two things are mutually exclusive when they're not. Um, but we can, we can have this chat at the end if you guys want and if you're interested in it, the whole um, rules of parsimony um, sometimes don't really work out, especially in ecology. Things can be more complex than they seem. So um, we did work on uh, harlequin toads because they had really a really solid database at the time. Harlequin toads are diurnal, which is really nice. You don't have to work at night. And they're really brightly colored and really abundant before they decline. So you could actually use these guys as, as sentinels of the declines. And this basically, this, this figure is showing you the number of species disappearing per year and the air temperature that was occurring. And basically what it's showing you is that when you had an abnormally hot year, you would get a higher frequency or a higher number of species disappearing. And at first when we saw this, it felt really counterintuitive. So chytrid obviously does better uh, under cool moist conditions or why were hot years actually um, increasing the chances of, or increasing the frequency of species disappearing. Now, one thing you guys got to remember about climate change is that it is not a homogeneous warming of the planet. I remember the year that I got here to the UK and um, the, the world was burning and we had like this cold cell parked right on top of the UK. Uh, Heathrow Airport was shot, there was snow everywhere and people were going, reading the news here going like, what, Gl global warming is happening? It's a hot year. And um, the, it, the world is very variable, averages are good for describing that averages, but the world experiences warming in, in very different ways. In the tropics, it is really interesting. And this is basically confirmed. And I'm again, happy to explain how we can get this sort of data, but it's, it's shown that um, cloud cover in many areas has actually increased. So there's two effects with clouds. Clouds have been highly deba uh, strongly debated, like what's happening with clouds uh, in terms of, of, of climatology and biology. Um, it's a contentious, um, it has been a contentious point, but basically the data shows that in a lot of the tropical areas, the warm years produce increased evaporation and that basically produces increased cloud cover. And then our hypothesis was quite simple. What happens then is that you have daytime cooling because you have clouds and at night you have nighttime warming. So it's producing this, what we call the climate ideal for chytrid, a more homogeneous environment in which animals don't have a chance to thermoregulate, to bask. And um, it just gives, creates these great, like perfect conditions for the, for the pathogen to emerge and to amplify its effect as it does that. Um, well, that was kind of like the start of my career. So I didn't even know what nature was, but I got quite lucky. Like my first paper was in nature. I had no clue what it meant, but uh, that's a big tick in my box. I don't need to ever go there again. Um, and um, I, at the time was still a student. And one of the things that I did was um, I started working in, in Guanacaste in the park Alex and I work in as a research assistant for a parasite group, that pe a group uh, led by Dan Brooks, who's um, worked in Canada for a long time as well. And he was basically trying to, to figure out how many parasites there are found in vertebrates. So we were running around the forest and catching vertebrates and looking at the parasites. And amongst the things that we found, which is really cool, was like a relictual population of these guys, Crowgrass to Ranoides, uh, 
this is my hand here holding one of them. They are, they're not that charismatic like Harlequin Toads in terms of how they look, but they are really cool in the sense that they are direct developing. So they will actually lay eggs on the leaf litter. And rather than having tadpoles emerge with that, they have a little froglet. So, so, so they go through metamorphosis in the egg. And then they avoid predation in streams. Obviously, that's one of the reasons why it probably evolved. But the interesting thing about this group, it's Mesoamerican, so it occurs between um, Mexico and, and the Can Panama Canal. They were really badly hit by these declines. And a part of their biology is to live along these streams. So they, despite the fact that they don't depend on the stream for reproduction, they are very much bound to living along streams. And we think today that that has mostly to do with their physiology. They just don't tolerate desiccation at all. And um, before they um, they disappeared in Guanacaste, so this is a picture taken from the Pacific. This is Witch's Rock. If you've ever done any surfing in, you've seen movies like Endless Summer 2 or any of those surfing movies. It's very, very famous for that. I love it. It's a great place. Cannot but recommend going if you want to surf in a spectacular place. It's one of them. ACGs. Um, I'm sure you've heard Alex hopefully speak about ACG. It goes all the way down from the dry forest to the tops of these lovely volcanoes. And this species used to find all the way across. And when they disappeared, they disappeared from the mountains in Costa Rica. So we are super excited about it. We wrote this natural history note and science is a really interesting thing. Nobody paid attention to it. Like we call the dry forest population refuge from decline, question mark. Nobody cared. So um, I ended up having to write a paper, <laughs> making it a little bit more fancy schmancy. So basically, we created a distribution model for um, chytrid for BD in Costa Rica. And um, basically, it's the classic Maxent species distribution model, which um, hot red areas are areas suitable for the pathogen to be found on, basically the mountains in Costa Rica. And then we, I simply overlaid the distribution of the frogs. So these, all these black dots here are where they used to be found, the species. And the white dots are this area here in Guanacaste where they are found today. So there's a nice meta population in this dry forest peninsula where they still persist. And basically what this showed in a very like cl clearer way than a nice small natural history note is that and wherever the frogs overlap with the pathogen, they disappeared. And wherever there was no overlap or the habitat seemed to be unsuitable for the pathogen, the frogs would persist. And we started talking about these um, climatic or environmental refugia. This, um, there's another way of you can express uh, data from species. So rather than geographical space, you can talk about environmental space. So you can convert one of these maps if you have some basic GIS skills, you can turn all these um, data of one square kilometer resolution variables into something like this. This is basically how Costa Rica looks like in terms of mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation. So all the grayed out uh, background here is all the possible combinations you have for Costa Rica. And the black dots is where you find, um, used to find Caragastrovanoides and where it disappeared. And the yellow ones here is uh, the proposed refuge. So basically, it's an, another neat way of showing you that these frogs persisted in, in the driest, hottest corner of the country, probably because um, it inhibits pathogen growth. Well, it actually does. We have the evidence for that. Now, um, I this is where we switch gears. And we will come back to Costa Rica at the end of the talk. But at this point, I would finish my master's. And I got offered a scholarship. And I did always want to work in the tropics. I don't really like I ended up having ended up in the UK. It was like an interesting, interesting decision that happened. Um, thanks to my wife, to Caroline. But um, we basically met up down there in Australia. And I was working in the wet tropics. And one of the reasons I wanted to go there is because the wet tropics is the birthplace of, of this field, the experts and the people that describe BD um, were all congealed at James Cook University at the time. And the wet tropics is this beautiful system here in the north east of Australia. So the, I lived here in James Cook down here. Cairns, if you've ever been there, when you go out to the Great Barrier Reef is up here. And all this grain, green, sorry, a, a habitat here is rainforest. So basically the wet tropics are, are a compact blob of rainforest. Um, separated by the Coral Sea and the classic Australian outback. Uh, 
And we knew at the time when I started there that at least the clients like in Costa Rica and in Latin America had been by a mostly on stream associated species. Some species the clients and other, other ones went extinct. The clients had been linked to the outbreaks of BD and they were really well documented in rainforest habitats. And um, so, you know, the next, just to break up the monotony of like slides, classic slides, I'll show you a few field pictures. So this was one of my first field trips. Um, I was driving out at night. And um, if you go out in Australia in the wet season, you gotta be careful and not drive straight into a bog. It took me two days to get out of that. And one of the cool things about doing field work in the wet tropics is that I spend a lot of time in the field. And this is something that I really have a strong passion for. I've never come up with a clever idea or an interesting idea by being in my office, reading papers. Everything I've ever come up with is by being out in the field and by learning from these lovely organisms. So you can put transmitters in frogs and follow them around. They find it a bit annoying probably to see you show up every day and find them consistently, but like you learn a lot about them. So for example, some of the things we learned about this, this is the waterfall frog, Litoria nanotis, and I'll tell you more about them in a bit, but basically, when we went out once during a cyclone, we got trapped in a mountain range. So we were trapped there, we had enough food. So we just ended up working. These are some of my volunteers at the time. And um, we learned that these waterfall frogs that are not supposed to ever leave waterfalls, they actually will, females especially, will go out into the leaf litter and they will spend days and days just catching food that's humid enough that they can like um, dislodge themselves from the stream. And then they're out there and um, foraging for uh, for food because obviously females have to form the egg yolk and um, that requires quite a lot of energy. Um, and, you know, Australia being Australia, we got a grant to like fly into some remote areas with helicopters. That picture there was taken in a place where we were about 600 meters above sea level. And, and we thought that we were in croc free territory. To our surprise, we found some big crocs in those pools so they can climb waterfalls, which is incredible. And we track, track the same species in the dry forest. We would stay in these lovely camps at a time for weeks at a time. And um, the same species, exactly the same species um, confirmed through genetics, very short distance from the rainforest. They will actually like spend the water rather than in cracks and crevices merged under the water and the females rather than going out into the Australian scrub, they'll stay in the stream and they are specialized on eating these freshwater shrimp. So they'll just sit there at the edge of the waterfall and when a freshwater shrimp pops around, they just, they just jump in and swallow the whole thing whole and this, you can see the eggs are forming here. So same species, very different environment, very different adaptations and um, very different consequences for disease, as I'll try to tie that story up in a bit. So the things that we do is like, um, you know, when you want to study populations, you got to, a lot of times we end up having to learn how to mark them. So there's different ways of marking amphibians. And um, this looks pretty gruesome, but it's actually a really good method, pit tagging. So it's the same thing as you'd have if you have a pet, a dog or, or a cat, they'll be microchipped. So it's exactly the same thing. You microchip them and then you just scan them. And then the advantage of that is like, it's really, really accurate. It lasts for pretty much ever and until the animal dies or disappears. And then when you find an animal, you can just scan them without having to grab it. And then when you're doing consecutive knives, nights on a transect, you can, you can then make sure that you're not handling an animal too much. When the animals are too small, you can then use other things like these elastomers, these fluorescent tags that you basically you create tattoos with, pardon, with amphibians. Um, People have been toe clipping and we can talk about that as well if you want. I try not to do it because I don't think it's it's great. It just really messes with their behavior. But um, if you need to get a genetic sample, it's probably one of the best ways of getting it. And um, do remember amphibians regrow their, um, their toes and young frogs can actually be a problem. Um, juveniles can regrow their toes in a matter of two weeks. And then the other thing you can do is you can rub a cotton swab over the skin of the frog and then you can like take that back to the lab and run a qPCR assay and see how, if the animal is infected or not and how infected they are. Now, this is just a quick schematic um, bit Mickey Mouse, but just to explain what happened during the declines in the wet tropics, for example, the waterfall frogs used to occur along that elevational transect. So let's say the coral seas on this side here and Australia is cut through on the East coast by the Great Dividing Range. And most humans live on this side because there's water. And then these frogs used to be found from sea level all the way to the tops of the mountains. And then when chytrid emerged, basically they disappeared from 400 meters and up, they vanished. 
And um, we know that the selective pressure of disease increases with the elevation. So the higher you go, the cooler it gets, the most moist it is, and the more likely it is that you'll die if you are having an infection. And we knew that lowland populations were persisting with chytrid. There are some times when conditions were cold and moist, um, when it's the winter in the Southern hemisphere, you would get some individuals dying, but as I heard, as a population, they're, they're overall all right. And we also noticed that some, there was, there's signs of recovery. So this was this big decline in the 19, early 1980s. And since then, some populations and some species have started coming back. But um, to my luck, at the time, it was really frustrating. The project that I was promised when I started in the lab, I went to in Australia, had been taken over by another PhD student. And there was quite a lot of work going on in the rainforest. And I basically got told, well, there's not really space here for you. And, and this is where your previous experience is really useful, having come from the previous story I've told you about the dry forest population of frogs I found in Costa Rica I went like fine I'll leave you guys to it in the rainforest I'll go and work in the dry forest I don't like mosquitoes anyway um, and I had spoken to some park rangers who were really lovely and um, they said Rob yeah it's really interesting I do know there's quite a lot of waterfall frogs in the dry forest but I, we've never really done anything with them because like the dry forest is not interesting Australia's and the wet tropics have had a really strong focus on the rainforest because it was logged for a long time and now it's world heritage, the same as ACG as Guanacaste. But um, these systems on the other side, of, side, on the Western side of the Great Dividing Range are really interesting because the, they have these very discrete habitat changes, these ecotones, and um, you basically get this rain shadow the western side of the wet tropics and you can have these wet sclerophyll dry sclerophyll habitats you can have one side of the stream is wet sclerophyll and one side is dry sclerophyll and the frogs were doing really well so i started working um exploring those habitats and it was quite hard to get in there and i had a set of questions when i started with this work um first one is what is the status of these dry forest populations do all non-rainforest refuge refuges function similarly are host pathogen interactions similar between wet and dry forests? And are there host behavioral differences? I thought that, you know, given the chance, could frogs do anything about these um, embracing these diversity of habitats for their own benefit? So the wet tropics in Australia um, had this group of, they call them torrent frogs, there's four species. Two of them had declined and two of them were extinct. Nobody had seen them in ages. They were rainforest specialists and um, they live in torrents on like strong waterfalls and very susceptible to, to chytrid and litorin and otis the species that i was really going to focus on was found in the dry forest as well we knew very little about its biology there i've already given you a prelude with the radio tracking data and i set up these um, pairs of sites um, but um, today i'm going to tell you mostly the story about this because like they are adjacent to each other and the patterns are very, I, I find them really impressive because they are right next to each other. So I set up these transects, these 400 meter transects, and the dry forest um, transect was between 720 and 800 meters. And the rainforest one was between 900 and 1100 meters. And the divide was this big waterfall that you can, it's about a 45 degree waterfall. You can actually climb when it's not raining. And basically to get in there, you had to four by four in. There was a gate, there's like, there is a gate um, here. So basically, once you get into this area here, there's nothing there. It's the carbine table, and it's an incredible place, full of um, endemic marsupials, gliding marsupial squirrels. It's just wonderful, best memories ever from that place. And I started running transects, and the sites look very different. Um, so as you would expect, rainforests have canopy, and it's all really humid, and the dry sclerophyll is really dry. There's a lot of habitat variability. And when you started running transects, you start getting, we, the, the patterns were really striking. Basically, there was way more frogs in the dry forest than in the rainforest. Way, way, way more. And they say a, a, a picture says a thousand words. This is like how a waterfall in the dry forest looks like. So because I worked with these guys so much, I can tell you that's a male, that's a female, that's a juvenile with water lizards. And these guys are social. I wish I would have had the time to like spend hours there just recording them with a night vision camera because they interact a lot people think that frogs don't these guys live in families and um, if you went to a similar waterfall in the rainforest you would mostly find like if you're lucky a female 
the population is female biased, and there's a whole backstory to that. Um, there's hardly any males, and there's no juveniles. Densities of animals is much lower. Um, and I was really bored after three years of sampling, and one day crossing this beautiful river, I decided to go downstream. And the, the great surprise there is that we found this guy, Litoria lorica, another one of the, the one of the species that was thought to be extinct. And there was tons of them there. It was it was really lovely to find like a big population of these guys. Um, so what is the status of these dry forest populations? Well, it seems like these rainforest frogs, and I'm saying quotes, are doing really well at the periphery of these rainforests. They're actually like doing way better than in the actual rainforest. Now, the next question for me was like, do these things function similarly, the Costa Rican system and the Australian system? And um, I've already mentioned like how we sample and basically what you can get out of disease when we talk about disease is like people usually quantify how disease has having an effect or infection is having an effect when you look at prevalence, which is the number of infected animals divided by the total of what you sampled. And with a qPCR, with a quantitative PCR, you get this intensity of infection measure. You can actually plot how much DNA of the pathogen you got. So um, yeah, you, you, can, you can get those values. Working there over the years, what I found is that water floor frogs you would find as predicted in other systems, like you would find dead and dying frogs and most of them would be um, juveniles, but um, you would find uh, you know, the floaters, we call them, you know, floating down the river, but a lot of these animals would be like sitting on a rock, they'd look perfectly fine, especially in winter, you tip them around and they're basically on their last leg. And this is how chytrid infection looks like without you know, looking at a microscope when it's really bad. It's basically skin sloughing happening. And when that skin slough falls off, you have this basically this inflammationary three mine and they don't last very long. You can tell right out very quickly if an animal, if a frog is sick by holding it in your hand, if it's just like basically not moving He's probably toast. We, well, a, a test we use in the field is called the writing reflex. We put them on their back and if they can turn themselves around, it's like something is not great for them. And this is just some of the data for one of the years. We sampled 580 frogs in the dry forest and we found no diseased or dead frogs in the wet forest. We did find some and um, basically we never found any diseased or dead frogs in the dry forest. So basically the dry forest was doing really well. When you compare the two systems, Costa Rica and Australia, they are very different. So the Costa Rican system is, um, you get about a 1% prevalence. It's like in the lowlands, it's really hot. In the Australian, up to 95% of frogs in winter had the infection and they seem to tolerate it. So very, very me different mechanisms. One, the pathogen is really rare and the other one, it's really common, but somehow frogs are tolerating the infection. And the Litoria loricas, those extinct frogs are basically occurring there. All of them are infected and they're fine. They're, they're coping with it really well. So do all these non-rainforest refugia function similarly? No, they, they don't. Um, Alex, can you check on the time, please? If I'm going too uh, slow, can you make signs if I'm going over, please? Um, I think I got 10 more minutes, five more minutes. Okay. Um, I think I packed a bit too much in here as I tend to do, which is not great. Um, basically, um, just quick um, way of uh, summarizing everything, host abundance high in the dry forest and the wet forest is slow. Pathogen prevalence is higher in the dry forest than in the wet forest. And that seems a bit counterintuitive. And uh, But if you follow this logic, bear with me, it hopefully will make sense. So if you're in the dry forest and you have an infection and you tolerate the infection, I will recapture you and I will be able to measure that you're infected. If you're in the rainforest and you get infected and you die, I'm obviously not going to recapture you. So the prevalence will be lower. So hopefully, I mean, that's a, a clear sign that there's some level of resistance or tolerance going on on there. And host mortality, none ever in the dry forest and, and high in the wet forest. Behavior is really interesting because if you start looking at behavioral traits of animals and see if they actually are able to use those macro habitats, it might tell you a little bit more about why some species persist in versus other ones. So this is work that was done in 2006, so a long time before um, I was there, looking at two different species. So this one, this one is the one I was studying, the waterfall frog, and this one is the green-eyed tree frog. Green-eyed tree frogs are able to go up in the back canopy and bask, Waterfall frogs just don't do that. They just hang about the stream or the forest floor. They never go out and thermoregulate. And then when you're looking at waterfall frogs, which is LN here, 
much more frog to frog contact, so much higher chances of transmission, and also much more um, contact with um, frequency contact with the stream. They're just hanging about the, the waterfalls and the streams. And um, when you track them, I, I started tracking them in three different places. So rainforest, mid elevations, and um, dry and wet forests. Um, and you can see some here with the transmitters on. I was trying to figure out what these differences were, but they became very obvious with time. And it became very evident when you start looking at the world through thermal goggles. So this is how the wet, the rainforest, the cloud forest looks like with a thermal camera. So th this is basically, hopefully you can recognize the stream and this is the substrate around the stream. And this is a frog. And basically because you have a closed canopy, that you don't have a really a chance for the substrate and the animals to warm up. If you're just restricted to streams, you're going to be restricted to this very homogeneous thermal environment. And the water is warmer than the substrate. And when you look, and you can tell it's roughly taken at the same time, when you go down to the dry forest, the rocks are much hotter. And frogs, when they emerge in the early in the afternoon, they can sit on these warm rocks and form their seal. This is the head here. So the wind was blowing that evening, so the, that was exposed. But underneath the belly of the, the frog, where infection starts, um, the temperature was way warmer. So um, are there host behavioral differences between wet and dry environments? Absolutely. There's something going on there that allows frogs to tolerate it. Um, and I think that that um, ex probably explains some of those patterns, but there's way more stuff that can be done about it. I'm going to finish with Costa Rica because now I have quit on Australia because um, philosophically speaking, well, I moved to the UK, it's quite a long flight to get out there, but also Australia has pretty much all the tools to do what it needs to, whereas Costa Rica feels like there's more you can contribute to the system. When I left Costa Rica, I thought that Krag Asteroidis was fine. It's in a World Heritage Site. It's all protected. Why would there ever be an issue with them? They're brown frogs. Nobody really cares about them except those biologists. But um, And we knew that there were several populations. These are the ones that I've studied the most. So this is the Pacific. This is Costa Rica here. And they used to be found up here in the volcanoes where they disappeared from. But um, climate change. Uh, 2014 was one of the driest years in the country. It had 68% of the long-term average and 41 in 2015. Effectively in 2015, it rained once hard at the beginning of the wet season and that was the end of it. So it was a failed dry season. Um, and it was the strongest drought since 1937. And this beautiful stream here that I studied for quite a while um, and I'd never seen dried out and the locals in the system that we work with, Alex and I work with, the true field biologists, they've never seen these streams start out, but they, it dried out and it was incredible. It went from being a beautiful stream spring in the water in the dry forest to being a few pools and tapirs love pools. And one of the things they love to do is to poo in pools while they're having a bath. So these streams went very quickly from these beautiful streams to like tapir poo infested water. And the community of amphibians changed radically in a matter of weeks and the frogs disappeared. And there's the data for it. So uh, 2003, 2005, 2012, in a 200 meter transect, you would find quite a lot of animals, they disappeared. And I'm gonna be honest, I keep going back there and I've not updated the data, they're not back. And the other thing that happened is that we have a freak storm, um, Nate, that went over the area and it also caused floodings and landslides and it trashed a lot of these streams. And the numbers in a lot of these streams have gone down. Now, um, going back to this map, so having never been worried about these populations here, I started really worrying about it because some of them had disappeared. Some of them had their habitat completely fragmented rather than having a continuous stream because of these landslides that were all fragmented. There are quite a lot of uh, populations here, but clearly the dry forest in Costa Rica is not doing well. It's a very Mediterranean-like climate. Insects are declining anyway. There's all sorts of big changes going on linked to climate change. And I was, I was really worried about the fact that there's also the Pan American Highway cuts the park in half. The stream in the dry forest here, is, these streams are not born from these volcanoes. The geology is really weird. So the streams born on these volcanoes here either flow to the Gulf of Nicoya, which is south, or they go up into the Nicaragua Lake, but they do not go into this peninsula. So there's no direct connection between these two things. So I started talking with our colleagues down at ACG and saying, hey, can we just move some 
from here to here. The distance is really short. If you can see here the scale bar, as the crow flies, it's nothing. But in ecological terms, for a frog that lives in streams, it's almost impossible. And, and they said, yes, you can, but we know about cryptic diversity. And how do you know the thing that used to live up here in Costa Rica and the volcanoes um, is the same that occurs here in the dry forest? The distance is very short, but the habitat's very different. And I said, fair enough. Let's see how we can answer that question. And um, I bring up a picture of Dave Wake. He's one of my personal heroes. He's like an amphibian biologist. And Dave, he's he's died this year, sadly, of cancer. He's, he was the gentlest, kindest, smartest person you would ever meet. And Dave was smart enough that in the 1980s, he was collecting and putting um, tissues in ethanol. And he was kind enough to lend me those tissues. He was at Berkeley. Those tissues got sent. And they're actually sitting. I shouldn't really have them here, but they live in freezers in my office. I have a, a collection of extinct tissues here in the UK now that I should probably find a better home for. Maybe I'll send them to Alex one day and he can have the responsibility of that. It weighs on me. But uh, I um, sequenced those. And um, so basically looking at the cloud forest tissues um, from before the declines, which are these green ones here. So we got four tissues that we managed to sequence. Um, for the species, uh, we had this really interesting pattern. So clearly there's two very different clades occurred in the cloud forest. One lines itself up really nicely with the dry forest uh, metapopulation. The other one was unique and was sister to two species that occur in Panama. Now we could have a long conversation about the taxonomy of this group. It is very complex, um, but I'm not gonna go into that taxonomical mess. I, I leave that to colleagues and friends of mine to like sort that stuff out. And um, the nice thing about it is that we did have then the evidence to show that dry forest ranoides used to also occur up in the cloud forest. And there was probably two sympatric species occurring up there. And that gave us the green light to start preparing the ground and to explore the options of doing a translocation and moving them from down here to up here. And that's part of what is now our National Geographic um, grant. Um, yeah, just to finish up, um, and happy to talk about the, you know, the conservation aspect of it, which is what I have the biggest passion for. With dry forest populations healthier than wet forest, dry forest refuge in Costa Rica and Australia are really, really important for frog conservation, but they function quite differently in terms of how they deal with disease. And, and why are Australian dry forest populations healthier? I think um, there's a good case for increased tolerance, and there's two things that could be going on, and um, pathogen virulence could lower over time and also increase of host immune responses and there's a couple of papers out there now that suggest that what's happened is that host immune response has increased and pathogen virulence has stayed stable um, and for conservation environmental refugia are really important if you want to ask me uh, what have i achieved in my career i've managed to extend a national park in australia and i'm super proud of that that's probably going to be the proudest thing i've ever been for they extended it all to now protect that ha habitat at the periphery where those Litoria lorica exist. Um, and then, you know, things that you learn on the way, torrent frogs are torrent frogs, they're not rainforest specialists. They need a waterfall, they don't need a rainforest. They will adapt, they're incredible. And the thing that everybody asks me is like, what do you need to do? You need to do active classic conservation like ACG does in terms of disease. Um, you do need long-term monitoring and you know we're experiencing that, experiencing that with COVID now. The UK has just basically shut down the amazing system they had to monitor COVID, and it's like much more reduced. And not those no longer have the response capacity to detect the things it had. And it all boils down to money always. Um, so with wildlife monitoring, it is clearly very important wildlife disease monitoring. But the question always is, who will pay the bill? And I mean, Alex and I will probably tell you more about this sort of thing, but like every research grant you get these years, we are really forced to produce results really quickly and they don't, long-term funding is really, really scarce. So if I could change something would be to talk to government people and say, hey guys, you really need to go back to funding long-term research. And it's not, it doesn't have to be that expensive. Uh, I'm wrapping up with saying thank you as I do. Volunteers, as you've seen, these guys are always been amazing students. Local support, without them, you couldn't do anything. And yes, frogs rule. And I always thank my kids because I do end up dragging them out to the forest and they are probably quite bored of it, but um, they're also amazing field assistants. And funding 
um, National Geographic and um, the Australian government for the Australian part, National Geographic for Costa Rica and Australia. And I'll take any questions at this point, if you have any. I 